Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring the topics of music, education, technology, and the intersections between them, with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. One of the things that I would expect to not allow to have caught on in our house just because it's one of these like goofy things in popular culture that it's like, I refuse to acknowledge that just because, you know, I'm being that kind of person who refuses to acknowledge <laughs> popular culture. But I, it's um, the acknowledgement of hard pants as being like any kind of bottom part of clothing that is not like a sweatpant or a yeah. uh, pajama. Yep. You know, I, uh, I uh, adore that word. <laughs> I've never heard hard pants before. This is yeah. the first. I like it. And I totally know what, what, as soon as you said it, is like, oh, yeah, I I have lots of hard pants I haven't touched in months. Yeah. No, I don't even think I put on jeans since March. Nope. Um, shorts are a little less restrictive. So I am wearing what I think would call classify as hard shorts at the oh, moment. Oh, yeah. Well, are they cargo shorts, like summery cargo shorts? Yeah. Because I feel like that's almost like a medium soft hard Okay. Yeah. yeah. And in between. And in between. Yeah. I feel a little, a little better going outside with the, you know, we moved in, in November. We don't, we're only just now meeting some of our neighbors, but still, I feel like we're in the first impressions stage. Yes. So you have to at least keep up a little bit so you don't scare them off too much. Right. Yeah. Right. I'll never forget the first time that I moved to the town that I ended up teaching in. Uh, the summer before I started teaching, I was like getting the house ready, painting, doing all that stuff for the, the you know the dirty work and I went to the grocery store and nobody knew me or so I thought they had put my picture in the newspaper because it was a tiny town and they'd like blasted my face over this is a new music teacher coming to town and of course there was like three people that recognized me from the newspaper and here I am in like paint covered nasty sweats and a tank top that's ripped and I was like great great just why funny. would they do that because they're small towns that's big news yeah I guess so yeah. <laughs> Well, as I feel like is always happening right before we pressed record, we were like touching on super topical stuff, yeah. but in sort of a roundabout way. I don't even know where to start. I mean, I guess I, I since I'm, I just have so I've, I've wrote a list of like all over the place kind of questions that are all, all related to the product soundtrack. But yeah, um, yeah. I guess I, you know, should I, I figured I'll just invite you like how when you, um, you know, describe who you are and your relationship to soundtrack, how do you? usually do that uh yeah so I, I mean I tell a story because it's what it is it's my story about how I got to living a completely different life than I ever thought I would uh so yeah when I went to school I went to school for music education I thought I was going to be a teacher for my entire life I had no intention of not teaching band and got a job at a small town nine years into it, saw the writing on the wall as far as consolidations goes. And so I started thinking, okay, I, I need to like look to see what I'm interested in past this because I could see that my job probably wouldn't be around forever. And if it was, it wasn't going to be the same job that I had signed up for. So that's when I looked into technology as being kind of a, a second passion and got a job at an AEA in Iowa, We, which are area education agencies. They serve like many districts with various um, services, special ed and, and whatnot. And so I was a technology consultant at an AEA just down the road from the school I taught at. And that's the, the fall of my first, yeah, my first fall there, I found Soundtrap because I wanted to bridge technology and music. That was something that I had seen, uh, when I was a teacher that I, I, I wanted to, to kind of explore. So I, I Googled something, I, I don't know, it was like music collaborations or something like that, because I thought there's got to be something out there that's technologically supportive of music teachers in our, in our rural situations. That's really what it was. It was like a small town didn't have a whole lot of um, opportunity for breaking walls beyond just their own classrooms. And so uh, stumbled on like a promotional video and uh, like a support address and reached out to them and said, hey... This is Meredith. I'm a teacher. I do maker spaces. And I think that I'd like to use this tool for um, teaching or at least encouraging music creation in these maker spaces. Because if, if, you know, science and technology and math and all of that is is being encouraged, why not the arts? And really, that's that's the rest of the story. I mean, that conversation started the the eventual 
you know, job that I have now, which, you know, it's been four years. <laughs> yeah. What is technically your title right now? I, sales enablement manager, which I'm not in love with the title. I, I, I love the work, but being a music educator and then having that kind of title, it's like, oh, that's like the opposite of, of, <laughs> of a teaching title. Uh, but it really is actually, I get to teach every day in my job because now I, I have an opportunity to work with a team of education specialists which that was my job before I, I moved into this role in the company. And, and so we have a team of, of music educators and, and also non-music educators that work with schools on professional development and resources. And they're the ones that if you go to any Soundtrap webinars, they're facilitating and presenting on the product and bringing in all the, the great pieces for furthering the teacher's knowledge and know-how of the product. And so I actually, I mean, that's, that's my team of ed specialists and I have um, a wonderful job of being able to uh, manage that work alongside of um, writing some content for marketing purposes and whatnot that's geared for, for teachers. Yeah. And we know each other from, you know, just me doing technology presentations at various music conferences all over the country and you are, you know, you're always there. Yeah. There for a while I was, I I've kind of taken a break. Well, obviously everyone's taken a break recently, but, yes. um, yeah, I, I, um, got this last year has been qu more quiet and I've done a little bit more under the hood stuff, which is, is a different job. And I think I kind of like it. It's, it's, um, learning, uh, the ins and outs of a business is, is completely different, but yet there are a lot of similarities with schools. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I had the opportunity to travel around and, and, uh, meet some amazing people like you and learn about what's been happening in school since I had left the classroom. And, and I will never not go to those places. I, uh, I think that, that those conferences are when I get my bucket filled the most. Yeah, for sure. Well, you mentioned the current state of things. So, I mean, I, I guess I'll put this out there. Like my goal, one of them for this podcast, and I, you know, I have had the opportunity to produce a lot more of this content since I've been at home, just because the nature of the teaching job has been a lot more flexible on time and scheduling. Um, I think it's a, you know, it's a good time to reflect on the very real possibility that school will not be normal mm. this August. And, you know, it's, I think most music teachers who are looking for digital tools to engage their students, um, you know, whether you're in a computer lab in the building or whether you're distanced, you know, I think Soundtrap is one of the names that's really out there. It's, it's certainly one that came up a lot in my own district. And, um, and, and you know, I, our, my, my school is now a customer. So through the Music First subscription, my general music class is yeah. now using Soundtrap uh, pretty much daily. I have certainly feelings about it that maybe will make more sense to talk about in a little bit since I've been using it more hands-on. Uh, but I guess I should ask you first, how do you usually... like? If we were on the showroom floor of a music conference and a teacher who has a general music class is just walking by, has never seen or heard of Soundtrap before, what is the, I don't know, elevator pitch? The elevator pitch is short and sweet. It's uh, if GarageBand and Google Docs had a baby. And, I, and I've said it like a probably a thousand times. Just so easy for people to wrap their head around that. They know what GarageBand is and they know what the capabilities are and they know what what Google Docs are and, and what their capabilities are. Mm -hmm. It's what you do on GarageBand, but it's in the cloud and it has a collaborative nature piece to it. And so that's usually we get the little light bulb on the on um, people's heads when they hear that tagline. But yeah, that's pretty much the long and short of it. It's yeah, yeah. GarageBand and Google Docs. Yeah, no, it, it's totally that. Um, and, it, you know, it, I think that to someone who's really familiar with GarageBand, which I am. And, you know, I'm like, I'm a very outspoken Apple nerd. Like yeah. I, not just for like, you know, it's the artistic software that I use that's on my computer. Like I'm a pretty big, I'm recording my side of the audio in Logic and we'll start the editing process there. And GarageBand I've used for years and years and years, but also like the app ecosystem on Apple products is something that I'm hugely passionate about. You know, like mm -hmm. their first party apps, third party apps, how it all integrates together. So I love Apple stuff, but there's um, in the public school system, some it's really easy to run up against some challenges to having exactly what you want. And, you know, I think in an ideal world, someone would just kind of cherry pick whatever software they thought that they were most competent in, and they might put that in front of their students. Um, but in 
the case, and I'm sure many people find themselves in this in this place. In my case, we were running into issues of uh, financial resource. Like we couldn't we could not keep our Mac Lab reliable and up to date enough where we could like depend on GarageBand to work consistently. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, you know there were a lot of other needs that Music First as a learning management offering were providing that class where like you know bundling soundtrap into it was just a no brainer it was just like hey we can have all of these features available to everyone they don't even have to be in the computer lab like i can give them an assignment to finish at home right and they can they can finish it in the cloud they can engage with one another in collaborative projects and if you have used garageband the interface is very friendly it's a lot of it's recognizable i mean i i hesitate to say that she's you know stole everything from garageband but i mean there there is a certain intuitive nature there's like an inevitability about some of the user interface in GarageBand that I feel like Soundtrap has borrowed the best of that and it's just like it's not a hard piece of software to use like it's immediately obvious where everything is yeah yeah I think the the one of the first videos I I saw was a teacher out of Australia had made like a 30 second clip of her of his students experiencing Soundtrap for the first time and they were grade one they were it was like if you google six-year-old and Soundtrap pops up and, and they're cute. They have this, these amazing accents and they're in their, in their school uniforms and there's what they're playing around and exploring Soundtrap for the first time. And, and the, the little girl has this sassy little tone. She's like, it's easy. You just do this and this and this. And she totally schools the teacher on how to use it. And that's, that's a, that's a huge piece because the, the idea of some of the DAWs out there, the digital audio workstations that we're used to in music technology classrooms specifically are quite intense. They're 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 dark interface. There there's lots of buttons, lots of of things to click on. The the creators of Soundtrap were very purposeful about how they designed the product to um, appeal to female demographic, uh, younger learners. They they did not want to stop the creation because of technology issues or or being intimidated by a piece of software. And although it may seem very easy to use in like a simple version of, of GarageBand. It's actually quite, quite deep if you get into it. But we, they, they purposefully hide some of those features until they're, you know, the user is ready to kind of unveil them or uncover them through clicking around. Uh, they don't want to show all of the features right off the bat because that might look more like the inside of a like a um, airplane cockpit or something. And and that's when people kind of start to shrink back. And, and I was one of those people. I, I didn't want to touch the DAWs when I was a, a band director. It overwhelmed me. Whereas Soundtrap, I, I could kind of wrap my head around it. And, and then later, you know, able to, to kind of intuitively navigate through learning the product without having to like read a manual. And, and that was, that was done very purposefully. Yeah, as a, a creative professional and someone who, as I was just saying a minute ago, I, you know, I love native software. I have to admit that in the education world and it actually in most of the rest of the world, there's a familiarity to web software. Like, hey, this just opens in a tab of your web browser mm-hmm. and you log in and the tools are all there. Um, and then you get in and you see, yeah, I mean, like I, I totally get the appeal. Like I, I never have really stopped to think about how bright and vibrant the colors of Soundtrap are. Mm-hmm. Um, but even things that you're used to, if you have used a GarageBand or another DAW, things like the the audio regions are like bright pink and purple and blue, like these colors that just like jump off the white background mm-hmm. of the software at you. And um, I don't know, I I'm in my mid 30s, and I think that color is fun. So if I'm in the first grade, <laughs> the fashion that I'm getting gripped. Go. Yeah. Uh, and it's not to say we haven't, I mean, we've, we've explored like a dark mode and I'm sure that down the road, there'll be that, you know, for the, those who, who appreciate that for their eyes and, and preference, but yeah, they, they kind of want it to be that, that the different DAW that maybe just appealed to a, a little bit different of, of people right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. And my students, they love it. And one of the things that they love in this solved another one of our technology challenges with using something more traditional like GarageBand was that, you know, GarageBand is managing uh, a library of samples and software instruments on the computer. And Mm. the management of those resources was very individual to the computer, especially because this particular lab was, um, had a little bit more freedom than our other computer labs in the building. So like everyone had its own unique login. Um, 
they could be managed with a little bit more control from my mm -hmm. perspective if I needed to. Um, but then what she would run into is like, someone's like, hey, he has, that's the, a cool synthesizer he has. I don't have that on my computer. Oh, sure. And and then the computers, of course, can't, they'll like crash and burn if you try to install any sample libraries. But on Soundtrap, every resource, even resources that are added to the program are just floating around the cloud, ready for you to you know, drag and drop right into the interface. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And we, um, yeah, I'm excited about the the future too. Stay tuned there because we've we've really made it a, a a goal of the the company to increase those as well. So like we have like I don't know five thousand pre recorded loops that are royalty free, but that's that number will go up significantly. I think here in the in the future too with the increased usage and and uh, requests for that because that is something that I think that that users are looking for and wanting. So. Yeah, pretty fun stuff. It feels like enough to me. Like there, I don't know what the number is that I would call enough, but there's definitely a number of samples and software instruments that once you hit that number, you kind of feel like you're limitless. Right. You know what I mean? Like there's no amount of time that an eighth grader is going to sit here in the amount of class periods we have and listen to them all and use them all yeah. in multiple contexts. Yeah, yeah. No, I w I'm happy with like 100. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. So the, um, you know, the fact that it's running on the web means it's, it's kind of like combining, I mean, the computer already with a traditional kind of DAW is, you know, it's that, it's that promise of everything inside the box, like the promise of, uh, I can make anything that I can imagine with this computer in front of me and this window into endless possibility. But then by having the software exist in a web browser, then you're sort of adding the cloud to that. It's like, you know, I was saying all of those resources are available to the student. Um, but then, of course, they can collaborate with one another in a unique way as well. How did that, was that an original feature of Soundtrap or was that something that was added after launch? Oh, that was an original feature. Yep. That was the uh, kind of the, I don't know, the bread and butter of, of what they had to offer. Uh, because what happened is by putting the DAW in the cloud, that now opened up that possibility, which had never been done. And this was like 2012. I think when it was first, um, you know, created the, the, the baby version. And so, yeah, they, um, yeah, it's always been there. Yeah. It, it works pretty reliably. My students really enjoy jumping into each other's documents and adding things and working together. Yeah. The, and what's great is, you know, with the EDU version, cause you know, Soundtrap has three, it, I don't know, it, like veins or products or whatnot, but like the Soundtrap for education, product has uh, the the permissions um, capability so teachers and owners of the account can kind of set like what kids can do in the in the classroom so if, if you do have younger learners and you don't want to have like the video chat feature on or the the text chat feature you can shut that off and and you can turn it all on and off at your at your convenience and then and it also has the assignment features which I think that's another huge piece that you know, it was a, a solution that I found, you know, as a band director, if I was going to use this in my classroom, I wouldn't, you know, I'm sending these kids home with their computers, let's say, and, and the, the program, which they can access, but how do they get what I want? How do they receive the assignment? And how do I get it back? Is it, is there Dropbox involved? How does it upload, download? And, and that's just something that's been really nice with the assignment feature in Soundtrap is that you just have like a, a, a source project and and it's forkable so you can you share that source project with the kids in a in a link and then that just makes their own version of it so then you have this nice little folder of like whatever 30 kids and 30 versions of the assignment and it's never downloaded it's just always accessible in your soundtrack profile maybe we, you can play a little bit of customer support with me for a second because I, I actually have a, a question about this yeah I, so um, I am using, like I said, I'm using this with Music First. And I guess for anyone who really does not know what Music First is, they are another, uh, you know, service that's worth checking out. Um, couple, You can listen to episode five, I believe it is, of this show for uh, more on that. But because sound, I'm sorry, because uh, Music First is has these LMS style features of adding assignments and tasks but then it can associate those tasks with third-party music software like Soundtrap. Um, I'm finding that the assignment making is, especially when I take a, a an existing assignment from a template, 
when the assignment uses Soundtrap as the application, and you don't know, you click the really convenient button that opens and says like, hey, make a 12 bar blues progression on the software keyboard instrument. And then there's a button that says open in Soundtrap and then boom, you open it in Soundtrap. Mm -hmm. um, do the Soundtrap assignments in any way, because you're what you were just talking about is like you're making the assignment in the actual Soundtrap application, not right. some other LMS. I was, yep. So that's a different workflow. If you have a music first, there's a, a there's one workflow for the assignments that you would want to, to adhere to. And then if you are not associated with music first, you would have a, a different assignment workflow that you adhere to. And that one being in your profile page, it's housed on that first page when you first log in. Uh, the assignment folders kind of stack up um, down, you would scroll down to see the most recent assignments there. Whereas the music first, you can actually um, turn in assignments in the studio, which is, I think they're the only LMS that supports that currently, which is really nice. Like the students just, you know, when they're working on the project, they go to within the studio, they could just be files submit to, I think music first or something to that effect. I'm not super yeah. familiar with that. Right, I can be like in Music First looking at an assignment that I gave and then I can see next to the students links directly yeah. out to their um, to their soundtrack projects, which which makes sense. I mean, a lot of the like lesson plans uh, we are using in um, in Music First. So like if, if there's a really good Music First lesson that's got like a little Spotify web player of some blues songs and then it's got a paragraph providing some history and then it's got a YouTube, you know, it's just something that has organized some content in a way that's much more efficient and engaging than I will be able to just lecture about. Right. I will give the students that assignment. So then it, of course it makes sense for that to be the place sort of like the central place that all of the work is conceived of, like starts mm -hmm. starting and finishing. Um, but since Soundtrap is also, it has some mini LMS features kind of baked into it, I guess. Yeah. Workflow has certainly been one of the things we're working through because we're, we're not even using music first as our LMS. We're using canvas as our LMS. Oh, okay. So, we're, so like music first is where we're giving some assignments, but ultimately the grades go in canvas. Um, okay. because that's, we have, we're one of these schools who we're, I, I've learned that we're in a minority. We're one of these school districts where the security is so high that, um, if it doesn't involve single sign on integrating directly into the other apps that our students use, yep. we have to create a generic username and password for each student. Right. That, yeah. Well, and I, and there's quite a few schools out there that in your same boat and, and, you know, rightly so they should, you know, that's, you know, student security and privacy and all of that. That's very important. And, and I think that that's, that's a very, you know, I, that's why we have our, our LMS integrations. We want to work with all of the schools in all their different situations. So like, one solution for larger schools that we've came into is we have a Google OU Sync feature. So the school gets to say, these folders that I have on my side can have access to Soundtrap. And when they turn that permission on, then anyone in that folder already automatically gets a Soundtrap account. They, they, when they log in for the first time, they're directly linked. And so for larger districts that have tens of thousands of students, that's a great solution because you don't have to roster, you know, all of those kids and worry about dropouts or, or, you know, changing over from group to group. Um, but then we also, you know, the smaller schools that have um, no LMS, that's why we have a few of those assignment features and uh, organizational features because they may not have, you know, uh, Google Classroom or Canvas or Schoology or any of those. So we try we, we try to live in all those worlds a little bit. And yeah, sometimes it, probably if you have Canvas and Music First and you might use the the embedded features, it could get, I could see a little messy. It does, yeah, it does get a little messy. But fortunately, these things are improving over time. Um, the fact that they talk to each other at all is impressive to say <laughs> the least. There's a lot that happens. That's another one of those things I was saying, like learning about business in the in the second life that I'm living is there's so much that goes behind closed doors that you have no idea about like developing a product and what's, you know, taken into consideration and how much work it, you know, it requires or maybe doesn't require for these changes. You know, something small might might be weeks and weeks of a developer's fix, whereas something large that is is very impactful for teachers might take them a half an hour and they just didn't know that they needed to do that little fix. But here my education specialists that are in with the teachers every day, hearing them, 
know these smaller features that would be helpful. And, and once you link those two together, it's really fun to see that magic happen and watch the, the product kind of build, build up to what we, we need and want. Sure. Yeah, I would like to now add a feature request. Okay, let's hear it. I'm doing doing all these things that this is not none of this is your job. <laughs> but I, wanna... I will make it my job. Well, right let me now. ask you this. <laughs> Sorry, I, before I even get to the point of and like, what are you? What is your involvement with the developers of the software? Do you have communication with them? Do you talk to them? Are you how how intimately involved with that process are you? Yeah, well, officially not so much. Unofficially, yes, just because of the being around the company for four years now, when it started, there was like 12 people and now there's a hundred. So I've, I've gotten to know a lot of people along the way, a lot of developers. Uh, we have, you know, we do have official syncs with the developers where they, you know, depending on the agenda, we, we talk about what we want or what we, we, we want changed. And some of it gets fixed or some of it gets taken, some not it, you know, we have a, a large pipeline, you know, of feature requests coming in the background. So let me hear you. I, I can hear you have a feature request coming. Yeah, no, I was just going to, yeah. okay. So I was going to say it actually is a music first thing. So I don't know if it's more on the music first end or if it's just a joint effort, but when you do the thing where you have an assignment in music first and then you click export to Soundtrap, I would like to more directly be able to create a template for the students that links to that assignment. So if the assignment is um, record a twelve, record a twelve bar blues improvisation using the blues scale. I think it's like a further reach for me to like just have it open to an empty soundtrack canvas. So what I like to do is have like a shuffle groove happening for twelve bars. I'll add the harmonic elements like a bit walking bass line and a piano, so that all they have to do is think about the scale, but that they have way more context. You know, what I mean, right. most of education is just making it feel easy for the students. Uh, yeah. as far as like setting up assignments and lesson planning goes. So, um, yeah, I mean, like I, I can do it. There's a workaround where you like delete the task and recreate it from a fresh soundtrack template that you've created. But okay. I would love to be able to just click that button and then whatever I do in soundtrack from the teacher account just becomes the template for the students who click that button. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And, and I, yeah. And I'm less familiar with the music first capabilities and more familiar with like what our, core product does. And I know that teachers can do that from the, you know, from the, our profile page, like within a, a project that they already have and they link that. So they create what you just said, the project with a template for the project, they save it and then it's in the projects. And then from there, they share the, the they create the assignment from that project. And right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So that's that's the only workaround I know. But now I I will work tirelessly to get you. I'm, <laughs> it may take. I'm, I may have to pay off some music first people as well because it sounds like it might be a a dual effort there. But well, I think it actually has to do with like because someone has made those lesson plans, and I think from previous conversations with them that I've had that it like involves the person who makes the lesson plan having a pre-made thing. But then still, what if I want to like make my own version of that yeah. template? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, just thought. So, no, it's a smart one. I, I like that. So um, one of the things I love about using Soundtrap in this classroom is, and I don't know, you maybe you can tell me if it sounds like you're writing some documentation. So maybe you were even involved with this, but there is uh, a ton of great documentation, but not just documentation on how the features work, like actual lesson plans that take you from pretty much zero to here's how you have, by learning our drum sequencer, by learning a uh, software instrument, how you've learned MIDI, how to record audio directly into the computer. Here's how you basically now turned yourself into your own one person band from zero to, you know, band project and there's this great packet that we have in our music office i teach this class um the seventh grade version of it is taught by the other band director at my school and so we both have this packet on our desk and it's just like the greatest thing ever because of how um intuitively organized it is with all the screenshots and the instructions like it's just really followable for a young person and i just want to give a shout out to whoever designed do you know the packet i'm talking about i don't Okay. I mean, I know, I, gotta find, I, uh, I know about our lesson plans and I know about our support page, but this packet is new to okay, me. Okay, I'm wondering then if just someone who is an educator just organized a bunch of your resources into a really good packet. Yeah, well, we need to find out who that is and say thank you and, and share it with the world if they're willing. 
Okay, if it is yeah. something that is shareable with the world, I will put a link to it in the notes to okay. this episode. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to see that. I'm wondering if maybe Nicole, she's the other band director at my school, I'm wondering if she did it. That seems like the kind of thing she would do is just like <laughs> make it and then make it seem like it was really easy because she's pretty brilliant. So maybe she was just okay. like, here's this packet, but then she didn't make anything of all of her work. I don't know. That seems, <laughs> that seems I, totally I like feasible. her already. I don't know her, but I like her. Well, that, all of that is to say that the documentation itself is obviously soundtrack documentation. So, yeah. um, so it's all really, really good, easy to follow. I mean, it's just it's just a great piece of software all around. What are some projects that are either that you see really commonly given in the classroom or that gets you really excited? Like when you see something that a student has made, like what are the, do you know what I'm saying? Like what are some of the, like you could obviously like do anything from making a one person band all the way to recording a podcast and soundtrack. So what are your favorites? Yeah, I, my favorite, like, and this is pre- pre-distance learning but definitely adaptable for for distance learning is when and it's not actually music related it's when you first introduce the 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 software to a learner and you you tell them to uh, record uh me in a minute podcast i think it's one of our lesson plans too is like talk about yourself for one minute into the microphone like who doesn't want to talk about themselves and I w- <laughs> so you, you have them do that. And all it is is clicking on the microphone, push and record. You can do that super easy. And watching them first listen back to their voice. There's something about a, a young kid that's never really used a, a decent recorder and then listen back and watching their face. It's just fun to, to have them. And then if you have them add like music as a background to that, like an intro music, then they just flip out and they're like, this sounds professional because it's got a little, like one loop that you've faded out, you know, at the beginning to, to fade into their voice. Uh, and so then you, you have that and you see this magic happening with the kids. And then, and then you show the teacher might be standing there and you show them our transcript feature which is when you have a spoken track, you click this button and it can transcribe the voice into written language. And then you can, you can say, do you see how you, you kind of got off on a, like you, you repeated yourself in this sentence and you only want to say it once and you highlight that text and you delete it and it deletes the audio file. And that's when everybody's like, oh my gosh, that's so easy. It just took all of my editing skills away. And and that's really twofold. Like I see the magic for the kids when they are given a voice and then the magic of the teacher seeing how easy it will be for the kids to edit their, their podcasts um, because they know, you know, you learn, young learners, you don't want them having to start and stop the recording 72 million times to trim the, the, the pieces out that you don't want. And so I really like that. That's, it's like a, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, well, what's the word? I, I'm I I love to see the magic the first time that they they turn it on and experience it. I'm excited by the feature. So I'm in many respects still a beginner in Soundtrap. How, what is so this feature? Does it link the transcript to the timeline of the audio? Yes. So if I said the word um, I can click the word um, and it'll move the project timeline bar to that part of the audio. Yes, and if you highlight the word um and push delete on your keyboard, it erases it from the audio file. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> See, that's so my favorite I, part right there. <laughs> maybe I should be recording my side of the audio for this podcast in Soundtrap. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that like that's what, you know, I was talking about those three veins of the company. One of them is Soundtrap for Storytellers. It's a product geared um, solely for podcasters and taking the, again, you know, you can use a high-end DAW with lots of, you know, technicalities that you want to like kind of, um, fiddle with yourself and get that exact sound you want. Or, you know, if you're the other 95% of the population that doesn't want to do that, but you still have like a story to tell, or you have an interview to give, this would be the, the, you know, the product that you'd probably be interested in to easily like start your own podcast fairly easy, um, to begin with. And yeah, that's one of the main features of that. And the nice thing is that the EDU side gets all the fun features from any of the products because they want to you know, they've always given us all the bells and whistles, which I've appreciated. I haven't ventured into a podcasting project with the students yet, but it's definitely something that's on my short list, whether it's like they each produce their own short thing, or if we do like 
one like my my pipe dream is to actually have them do something like a smaller project where they just get the feeling of producing the audio Mm -hmm. in small personal projects but then i think it would be fun to actually have one podcast for the class where they share and talk about their music projects that Mm -hmm. they've made in soundtrap and then that actually like i would submit you know to the rss feed and to apple podcasts and have that be you know, a public thing. Cause I think that that would be kind of a fun way to showcase their work. Yeah. And that's all oh, that reminded me of like, I met a band director and his name escapes me. He's on our blog and I can, I can get you know, the name later. He was from like, Oh, anyway, I met him at TMEA like four years ago and he came up to the booth and he's like, okay, you have to listen to this. And he shoves his phone in my face and says, listen to this. And I was like, okay. And it was, uh, a, like a fifth grade girl talking about a piece of music and then it played like some excerpts from the music that she was describing and talking about and then it, it like it pivoted to a boy talking about the the song and and it went on like that for a little while and I was like that's that's cool and he's like no 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 you have to understand this is how this is soundtrack has saved me with this project and and he said when he was teaching the year before he would like be listening to music in his car and getting to school and then shutting the radio off and then going into the school and then he noticed how like quiet the halls were and how nice it would be if if you could hear music in the halls like before school uh for the kids and for everyone and so he turned it into like a cross-curricular project between like the technology department and the literacy department and the music department is that these kids created essentially podcasts they they I don't know if they chose the music or were assigned a piece of music, but they they had this piece of music and they could break it out and then they had to talk about it in certain regards. So it wasn't just music playing in the hallways in the morning. It was these students' projects. So it could be that this fifth grade girl's project was playing over the speaker. Her, you know, first grade brother could hear her sister talk in the hallway. The teacher could, you know, hear so-and-so's um, project in the hallway. And then ha- and there was just a lot of connections that were made during that and he was so excited because he had seen that, you know, it wasn't the traditional way of teaching music. It, it was, it, and he said it was, it was tougher. It was a little bit more challenging because he had to get the the buy-in from the other teachers. But once that happened, then it just kind of blew up into this huge thing. And, and I think it even ended up with like, they had to refit the whole school with sound equipment in the hallways because it was, it, it was at one point they're just like, this is too good to not do every day. And so then they decided to support it further. Uh, and I just, I always love that story because that's how he kind of got started in podcasting. Hmm. Wow. Well, I, I like the podcast angle of this discussion. It's a natural turning point. I kind of wanted to, and I, I don't know how the, how interesting this is to music teachers, but it's interesting to me being, being someone who likes podcasts, ha- having a podcast, obviously we are recording a podcast. Um, I think how Soundtrap fits into that space is intriguing to me. You all were purchased by a, a company that no one has probably ever heard of called spotify a few years ago yes um what what has been what has that been like i'm not sure how much you are allowed to talk about but i'm curious like i know spotify obviously has um at this point it's no it's no secret they're making um you know lots of podcast acquisitions uh they also own an app called anchor which is an app that's designed to help you really easily record and produce podcasts on mobile devices. And it also has its own ad kind of like, um, add your own ads to your show through our back end kind of a service that they provide. Um, recently like Joe Rogan and, um, the Gimlet media were purchased. Like Spotify is definitely pushing podcasts in their app. They're definitely, uh, highlighting it all over the place. It seems like Spotify has a plan for podcasting and you know beyond as a music teacher beyond launching soundtrap and seeing that the two project options are music and podcast beyond that i wonder like are you able to talk about maybe what's down the pipeline or like how does how does soundtrap fit into that bigger picture vision for spotify and podcasting yeah i mean i i the nice thing is that when we were acquired by Spotify, you know, there was a question of like, what does this look like for the company? Because acquisitions can, I think, look a lot of different ways. And the beautiful thing is that they very purposefully have maintained Soundtrap as its own company. Like we still have an office away from, from the mothership. We, you know, deal with mainly just Soundtrap stuff. There are obviously some, some back and forths with the 
the greater company and collaborations, but they wanted to maintain that magic that was happening in a startup for a while. And so we're still in that phase of developing our product, making it, you know, the best that it can be for our users. And I mean, yes, obviously there's going to be plans for bigger integrations, I'm sure in the future. And, and yes, Spotify is, is living in a podcast and in the podcast world quite a bit more recently. And, and, you know, they just, you know, I think their mission, and I should know this like verbatim, but it's essentially is democratizing music. Uh, well, before was always, you know, democratizing music uh, consumption. You know, it's, it, it, we want to make sure everybody can listen to the music that they want to listen to. And, and I think that, that an easily, you know, that's a, as a first step. So what's the next step is to, you know, empower people to be able to create the audio and make a living off of the audio that they make and, and really just, um, encourage the creative, um, the creative aspect in the best way possible. And so I, I don't know the bigger strategy. I don't know, you know, how all the parts will fit together. I, I, but I can say that the short time that I've been with them, which is almost three years now, um, I've never been so proud of, of an employer as Spotify. They, they seem to be doing things in a very thoughtful and like loving and purposeful way. And so I'm knowing that I'm really excited about what they do have planned. I, I trust them wholeheartedly. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's in a nutshell, we're still just kind of trucking along doing our thing with a little startup feel. Yeah. So first of all, awesome, because like I, you know, Soundtrap is first and foremost to me, a, a teaching utility, and it's not something that I would want to lose in the classroom. It is of all the software I've put in front of my music class. It is the thing that gets the most engagement and, you know, allows us to unleash our creativity, you know, in the, in the most sort of unhinged way, like where the possibilities are most limitless. So, I mean, I'm glad that it's not only is it keeping a firm footing in the music education space, but that, um, you know, none of the strategy or tools have necessarily changed drastically. Yeah. So not really like thinking about or like knowing maybe like what's, really far down the road. I guess that leaves you free to speculate. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, yep. that's fair to your, to your parent company. I mean, what do you think? Do you think that like, that does it make sense that is Soundtrap, do you think in public schools, more of a way to expose young people to making music and podcasts so that they are listeners of music and podcasts, or maybe even want to use Soundtrap to produce Spotify content down the road? Mm, no, I, I don't know if that's, no, I don't think I would even go that far. I think that they, they have, um, I think they've seen that we have a very powerful tool for, um, student creation and, and a successful tool and they want to see where that goes and they love the education piece of it. They love that. Like, like take, take the distance learning for example, like in this, nobody knew that was going to happen. Nobody knew how to handle it when it happened. And, and we gave away our tool for free for everyone in the whole world for the rest of the school year, for the, the spring of, of 2020 for like four months. Like, it's crazy. Like I, I, I can't even, like, I would not have thought that would be something that any, I, and I know some other companies jumped on board with that as well, but they were very, you know, they, they wanted to make sure this was for the kids only. It's not about lead generation. It's not about sales. This is the, the kids and the teachers need this tool right now at this time in our life. And we want to make sure we provide the resources and the support for that. And I think that that just shows you where their, their vision is. It's, it's that they have this great edu tool and they're going to see where it goes uh with what you know our environment needs at the time and and you know not sadly because i'm also excited about where education's heading with distance learning i mean i i want everybody to be back in the classroom like they were but you know it's really pushed teachers and educators and and parents and and students to adopt technology in a way that i don't think they a lot of them knew had capabilities here and 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 not just Soundtrap, but there's lots of softwares out there that are helping kind of like hold their hand through that process. And, and it's not, 
you know, it's not something that's going to go away, but it's something we want. Like you said, and your kids were super engaged in the classroom when they had Soundtrap. We need them super engaged at home if they're stuck at home or, or if they're, you know, having to learn from home for a while. And, and I think, I think that they did right by that and they continue to, you know, think about what's best for kiddos. There are probably a lot of people using your product right now who were not before, who are maybe one step closer to purchasing it this coming fall. You know, it's, it's the kind of thing where like once you've used it and relied on it, it's like, well, how do I live without this? Right. Well, yeah, it's like the best pair of pants. Like I'm going to go and buy three more pairs because they just fit so perfect. <laughs> sure, Although not yeah. the hard pants that you were telling me about, like sweatpants <laughs> in, the, in the age of COVID. I am not buying any hard pants for a very long time. <laughs> Yeah, but no, I mean, it's it's um, it's a good thing. And, and, you know, I think that having these tools and meeting in person advances us, you know, in, in public education. So, um, and, and users of your product everywhere. You know, I think Soundtrap is something that, you know, I, I'm speaking from my perspective as a music teacher. But, I mean, I think that we are better having these kinds of tools in the classroom. So the people who have advocated for them and who have maybe found themselves in a position where they're using it or depending on it or the school district is just swinging for the money to pay for it mm. around this time. You know, I, I hope that like, I, I don't know if I see any like major school reform surrounding technology happening because of this as optimistic as I want to be about that. Um, but I, I do see it as a, a real opportunity to find some of these tools and engage them in a different way. I mean, the fact that my students, like my general music class wouldn't have been able to do anything without Soundtrap right. the past three months. Sure, I could like put a piano diagram in, an, in a Canvas assignment page and then have them like print out a, a piece of paper that had, and, you know, like take a picture of their hand, you know, on the C, the E and the G of the C chord. Or I could have them like go out and listen to sounds in nature and like write a reflection. I mean, there's lots of things I could do, but the fact that they were actually making music uh, it was was super cool. Yeah, and and that's a, that's the story we've heard over the last several months about. And I and I invite you and anyone that's listening to peruse like our edge blog, which is it's kind of hard to find, but it's and I'll have, I'll give you the link when we're done. But we post our user stories there, and these teachers they're not getting anything except they just want to share their story with the world. So they're and and we've just kept hearing all of these you know similar stories with that same magic that was like. I don't know how I would have connected with my kids. I don't know how they would have, you know, felt, you know, uh, buy-in here if it weren't for this and that. And, and you are right. Like you can, good teachers can always provide opportunity, but I think that we're at that time in our education system where we need to start thinking about how those dollars are spent. You know, like I, I, you know, personally have an issue with, you know, paper textbooks that are out of date pretty much as soon as they're printed. So what are we spending, you know, a lot of money there or is there a lot allotment for, um, supporting other, you know, creative tools, you know, schools are great on productivity tools and, and learning, you know, all of the core subjects, but how are we, how are we supporting the creative arts in, in that as well? So. Yeah, totally. All right. Uh, every week there is an app and an album of the week from myself and the guest. And um, I'll just say uh, usually app. I don't know. I'll, I'll be tr I'll keep the tradition. App has been going first. So I'll say an app of the week I'm using. Um, this is uh, an app that possibly has some relevance to Soundtrap. I mean, if you're in a situation where you're finding yourself needing to download the media to the local hard drive of your computer for any reason, this actually was true for me because I had some students, like I said, who were having trouble submitting their soundtrack projects to me through music first so okay. i had them just download it as an mp3 and then share it with me on canvas which was ultimately where i had to grade it anyway and um you you run into uh lots of you know when you're dealing with all these different students and their different computers and different file formats you sometimes run into issues opening stuff and there's a really great mac app that i've been living for over the past couple months and it's called Permute, and uh, it's a little got a little robot, cute robot face icon, and it is a fuss-free file converter for the Mac. And there's there's tons of file converters out there. Like there's a VLC, which is what I always recommend to most people. It's it's a great free 
version. But permute is just nice. It's just got, it takes all of the messiness out of the equation. You just have a big square that you see on the screen once you open the app. You drag a file into the middle of the square, and then there's a little drop down menu. What kind of file do you want it to be? You can turn a video file into an audio file. Or you can even convert a video file into a different kind of video file. Super essential for making my virtual band videos and getting weird Windows file types on my Mac. So you just select what you want from the drop-down menu, and then you can do one at a time, or you can batch edit a bunch of different files, and then they all just go straight to your downloads folder. And it always works fast. It's a clean, beautiful user interface. I think it's like 20 or 30 bucks, the app, but I've been relying on it for the past three months, and it's wonderful. That sounds great. I need to check it out. Yeah, it's great. It's a good one. Awesome. Uh, well, this is an oldie but goodie. Uh, the Innovator's Compass. So if anyone out there that's listening has to facilitate discussion, which I would hope that any educator out there has is facilitating discussion because that's what we need to do more than anything right now. There is a questioning. I don't even know what it's really called, but it's, it's a five question like... Um, protocol, I guess, or like, uh, there's five questions that you use to kind of facilitate this discussion. There's an online component where you can actually use it like a sticky board where you, you'd have the kids go to this URL and it's the, this, this compass. So it's, it's broken into like four quadrants and one in the middle. And the first one in the middle is, and this could think about this being applied to any situation. This could be like family. It could be teaching it could be professional development but the first question is 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 surrounded around people and it's who's involved so it's like who is at the center of your work right now the second one is is the observations about that so what's happening and why third one would be principles so what matters most in the situation fourth one's ideas what ways are there so this is your brainstorming section and then number five is what's a step to try so like the execution piece of it and it is so fun to, to have this applied to different situations and have the kids, like if they have a problem, this is, you kind of work them through this innovator's compass and, and you could do it with like paper and pencil. You could even just talk through it just now, like you and I, but the online component's kind of nice and it's free. And then the, the, the lady that, um, I can't even remember her name. I should, um, she's great, but she's like, it, you know, it's an open concept as far as like, use this for what you need to use it for. Um, so I highly recommend it. It's, it's innovatorscompass.org. It's a great, um, yeah, unsticking tool for discussion. Awesome. I always learn about new stuff during this part of the program. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And it's I have awesome. to give kudos to my colleague, Audrey Eau Claire, who who shared it with me. She's, I believe, friends with the the creator, and she's the one that, that uh, introduced me a, a while back. Cool. Well, album of the week, um, I, I have been uh, – this is like – I don't know what what constitutes a music nerd. This for some reason it's not like I haven't like exposed my nerdiness on previous <laughs> segments before, but this is like a special kind of that. <laughs> um I was listening to an album by a band called Dreams Come True. They're a Japanese pop band. And Ooh. their their band leader um Masato Nakamura is uh known for composing the music for the first two Sonic the Hedgehog games on the Sega Genesis. Seriously. That's yeah, awesome. it's it's great. Yeah, so they've got some stuff. Uh, they there. I think they came together in the late '80s and then were around in the early '90s. I just get a like. I I just feel a little bit like you you can hear a little bit of that video game influence. Like if you were playing video games in the first half of the 1990s, you, you just it's like it's good catchy pop music, but then you just hear like enough of a hint of that influence that you just get kind of nostalgic in a way about that. Would you know it if you didn't know it? I would say probably not. Well, the album I've been listening to is called Love Goes On, and I don't think it's it's very overt, but um, certainly some of the solo musical projects of the band leader who did the, the Sonic soundtracks, uh, I think, have more of that. You know, it's like you, you're like, oh, this sounds like video game music when you hear yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, that, okay. I have I just opened them up on a tab, so to, like when we get done, I'm going to listen, and then I'll text you and tell you what I think. <laughs> It's good fun. Huh. It's good fun if you're looking for some catchy pop music. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm old school. Um, I, I And I, I think I told you this earlier that last night I watched Rocket Man w- the second time with my girls who are 9 and 11 and my husband. 
And now, again, just like three months ago when I saw it the first time, I was obsessed with Elton's music again. And it's just, I think more than anything, it's like the experience of watching that movie with my kids and having them, each song that came up, they're like, ah, I know this song. Oh, I know this song too. Like they, they totally didn't know the same guy did all those songs and that this guy had this huge, powerful story behind why he is, you know, as successful as he is and how he, you know, kind of came to be. And, and, and I think also a part of that, you know, as a music educator is, and I don't want to ruin the movie for those who haven't seen it, but, you know, they talk about his music education and how, how he, um, well, let's just say engagement was definitely important for him. He needed to, he needed to release that, the creative power, he, he, the confines of the classical music education that he was getting wasn't quite cutting it. And, uh, and I just, I could listen to Elton John's music all day, every day. I just adore it. Can you compare it to any other movies in that genre? Like I, I have to be, I might make you upset right now. I might make you very yeah. upset. I, we watched Bohemian Rhapsody when it came out on some of the streaming uh-huh. services. And I just like, I just didn't jive with it. I was entertained uh-huh. the whole time, but, um, so like, would you come? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So funny story is that everyone I talked to that have seen both said Bohemian Rhapsody, a uh, rap Bohemian Rhapsody has, has, does not even hold a candle to rocket man. And, and I watched him, my husband, he said that same thing. He's like, really? Like, cause he did like Bohemian Rhapsody. He loves that music anyway. So that was a good buy-in for him. But he went into it knowing that someone had said that. And he said, yep. Like halfway through the movie, he's like, no question. This is so much better than that. And he's right. I mean, I, from an artistic point of view, more than anything, I, I think that Bohemian Rhapsody is, is a bit more for the masses. This one is a bit more for the musician. Okay, that's good to hear. Yeah, the thing that a lot of these movies do that are about really, really famous people is they tend to take the most obvious character flaw of that person. I'm thinking like Bohemian Rhapsody is a good example. Another movie that comes to mind is like the Steve Jobs movie from like eight or so years, whenever that came out. Yeah. Like they take they take like the low hanging fruit of an obvious character flaw and then they just build in the entire narrative around it. Like it's like that flaw is the whole person's life. And that never comes across as authentic to me. So I almost I, prefer, yeah, go ahead. I, was just say, I think the difference with this one, which I, I hope you'll find pleasantly surprising is that it is a musical. I mean, it's, it's not, they don't just show the songs, you know, in concert form. It's, you know, embedded in the story that it tells, which I think that's a turnoff for some who don't necessarily like musicals per se, but I just really, I, I think that they do a nice job telling the story through, through the musical format of it. Yeah, that's good. Well, I feel like if you're going to like overwhelmingly bias yourself towards one way of looking at a really famous figure, I feel like you have to, I'm always going to resonate with the more optimistic approach than like the, here's the flaw and let's exploit it. Cause that, that never comes across as like, you know what I mean? Like their flaw could never so conveniently drive every part of this drama (laughs) in the way in real life that it does in this movie. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But no one can turn down a musical celebration. No, right? It's hard. I mean, I even got sucked into, oh, I don't even want to say this. Um, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, great. I love the music, but it was uh, featured on a uh, Riverside, a Riverdale, Riverdale episode, which if you don't know Riverdale, you should never need to know it because it's, <laughs> it's like a guilty pleasure of mine that I should not watch because it's for high school kids. But they did an episode and they did all the songs to Hedwig and it was amazing just because of that music piece of it and the costumes. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. I'm a sucker for musicals as you can tell. <laughs> yeah. Well, who isn't? Right. I guess there are people, plenty of people who aren't. Yeah. I come across to some as like kind of a musical hater just because I don't share the same like overwhelming enthusiasm about them. But I always, I always get in line when I'm in the theater. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Like when we, you know, I, it's been a long time. I actually think it's been the Book of Mormon was the last time we saw a musical live, but, um, you know, like a professional one. And I, it's just funny because it's like as much as I'm not going to ever jump on the train of like all my musician friends listening to the words and reciting them and tweeting about their eighth time seeing Hamilton. I'm also <laughs> the first person to, to be like, this is the greatest thing ever when I'm actually in the theater. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just... Once you're there. Yeah, I totally get that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been fun. Um, we should do it again sometime. We totally should. Thank you. I really appreciate, you know, 
way. Hey, connecting with you. I had spent a long time since I had talked to you. So this was nice to have this conversation. Yeah, totally. Tell Tim, um, I'm really sorry. Like, I think that his turnip enthusiasm started like right after I had pumped <laughs> hour 160 into Animal Crossing. And <laughs> Oh, I forgot that you were an Animal Crossing person and he talked about that once. <sighs> He's like asking me some Sunday mornings, like, what are your turnip prices? And I'm like, oh man, that game is kind of like behind me. But I, but I still booted it up just to be sure that I don't have <laughs> <laughs> well, he must have found somebody online because he's apparently some like bill billionaire now. And so like money is not an option or not a problem anymore in that world. So I'm sure he'll probably be where you're at pretty soon. Like, oh, that was so like last month. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Reddit is full of people who play the turnip market. So. OK. OK. See, I don't even know. I mean, I have a house with bugs crawling all over because I never actually play the game. I did once. <laughs> it's a fun, fun escape. <laughs> Yes, my girls love it. They they are hook, line, sinker, sucked into the Animal Crossing world. And you have a little one now. I am, Congratulations, by the way. Thanks, yeah, he's five months. Well, it was just like, I just saw hospital pictures yesterday, I swear. You know, it, yeah, that, right, that's how it always is. It's all, it always works that way. We're, we feel that same exact way, and we're like living under the same roof as him, so. Oh. Uh, yeah, he's cute. I mean, you, you've, you know, you've had a, a five-month-old before, so you know, that this is like a really cute and fun time. It's super fun. Oh, and the best sound in the world. I don't know if you've experienced this yet. Like if you're at a restaurant, well, obviously we can't go to restaurants right now, but uh, back when we could, hearing other people's children or babies cry was like music to my ears because it wasn't my own kid crying. Oh, interesting. Is that yeah. kind of sick? I'm not sure, but like, I just remember getting joy out of other kids crying and knowing that it wasn't mine. 